Jennifer Jane, Eduardo Garcia, and Philip Darabu. Thank you for coming to Google today for a talks at session. Um, let me begin by introducing you properly. We have uh, Eduardo Garcia, subject of the film, charged, documentary rather. Jennifer Jane, his longtime friend, uh, subject of the film as well. And actually, they're both co founders of Montana Mex Food Company, a Bozeman, Montana based specialty foods company. Um, we also have Philip Darabu, who is the director of Charged and uh, previously the director of Unbranded, um, another critically acclaimed documentary, which is available on Netflix. So thank you for coming today. You and um, you know, a little context is that I actually met um, Eduardo and Philip at uh, an event run by the San Francisco 49ers Foundation, like Tahoe recently. And you had a group of people who are used to seeing inspirational things, including a cadre of um, former and current professional football players. People are not moved easily by emotion. Um, and everyone I spoke to afterwards, to the person, were incredibly inspired and moved by what they saw with Eduardo. And I think what's incredible is that you've taken something that might have crushed other people and actually turned it around to make it a positive, and you were motivated to go out and inspire the world. Right? So let me begin by saying and asking, what actually happened to you that day? Give us a little bit of background, the story. You went out on a hunting trip, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. right? a backwoods trip, and your life completely changed. Yeah, um, hunting is part of my core. You know, it's part of my passion um, growing up in the hills of Montana. So it's not uncommon that you'll find me totally off grid and off service from September 1st to November 31st. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was hunting for elk and came across a, uh, a dead baby black bear, which is about as bizarre as you can make it, you know. And um, not knowing that that dead bear was on 2,400 volts, I took a knife out, put it in my left hand to just investigate and received a shock that ended up resulting in, you know, 48 days of ICU and nearly taking my life. So, Eduardo, one thing that really makes me stop and think here is that you're a person, both now and before the injury, before the incident, someone who really depends on your body, right? Yeah. As a chef, as an outdoorsman. And so you went from zero to 60, being able to mm -hmm. depend on a fully capable body, right? To not being able to do that in a split second. So what did that teach you about yourself? And I think more importantly, if you were to be able to go back in time, right? Would you choose to have let that happen now or not? If I could go back in time, I think there's other things that would change, quite honestly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's quite interesting. You know, we, I think we rely, on our, um, we rely on the things that come natural and our primary, our primary skill sets, whether they're physical or psychological or emotional. You know, we go to those things that we know best. And so when you lose your latissimus dorsi and they just basically remove it from your hip and wrap it around your, your, um, you know, your torso to make up for the obliques and pectoral muscles that I lost, you no longer have that latissimus anymore. And, um, but I, I have to tell you that once that's removed, you find out quite quickly that you have all these sub-muscle groups. And this is just a metaphor for life, right? You have all these subgroups of smaller muscles that are just waiting for their day in the sun. They're just waiting to get out and kick some ass, you know? So when you call on them and you say, okay, little guys, it's time to step up and like flex, they do. And, um, and so for that, my life is much richer, you know? You take that down to the other parts of life and um, through this injury, there's a huge, huge stroke of humility that I've been dealt. And then a phenomenal fountain of understanding uh, about myself, my friends, my family, and, um, and maybe even my purpose, you know? You know, one of the things that I think about when I think about your journey is that um, as strong as you are, it's not only about you, right? It's, it's yeah. about the community that surrounds you. And I'm looking uh, at some of them in this room, people have dedicated a large portion of their lives to helping tell your story, right? Um, none of us are an island. So, so what did you learn about the importance of, of friendship and people going through this process? Yeah, um, it's interesting. The, the mind of a patient, right? Everybody is giving you everything. Well, hopefully. You've got everyone from your surgeons to your nurses and then to your friends and community, like you mentioned, Phil. But it's all coming this way. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I think there's a, a eureka moment that hits where you realize, like, you kind of, like, look at Jen. You're like, so remember there's a scene in the film, for anyone that hasn't seen it, where 
Jen's been sleeping for 48 days in this recliner that's spring-loaded. So when you lean back, it kind of pops into a reclining position, but if you take any pressure off it, dunk, right? So in her sleep, she would doze off and then it would just launch her forward. And it wasn't I, heavy enough. It wasn't yeah. heavy enough. So this is, and Jen filmed a lot, uh, all of the ICU stay. And so there's a, there's a scene where Jen put a camera on a tripod and filmed this jerry-rigging MacGyver moment where she's taking her carry-on bag and using her belt and rigging it to the back of the recliner so that it lays flat. And, and she caught beautifully, just in you know, just raw footage of me saying, geez, you've been doing that every day? You know, and so at some point the patient switches and you realize like what it takes to be a caregiver, what it takes to be a friend, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's oftentimes even harder, really, than the patient, because the patient's getting everything. Which is actually a, a good segue in that, you know, Jennifer, correct me if I'm wrong, but you had mm -hmm. been um, you know, partners with Eduardo. Mm -hmm. um, uh, previous to the accident, had actually gone back to England mm -hmm. to continue your life and came back to actually take care of him and help him through this journey yes. and to capture it on film. Mm -hmm. So wh why did you do that? What motivated you? <laughs> well, there's a lot of answers to that question, I guess. But the So for anybody that hasn't seen the film, Eduardo and I had a very turbulent relationship and about, um, I think it was about 10 days before he was injured, I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go. And I did, and I flew back to England. And so I was actually in England when I got the phone call that he had been injured. And uh, I got on the plane. Actually, just before I got on the plane, I spoke to him, and we thought it could be the last conversation, which was obviously very emotional. And then I got on this plane, and he went into his first surgery. And I had zero way to contact the ground. So I had eight hours to sat on this plane, hoping that he would be OK. And during that time was when I got to think, you know, in a way it was good to have that time to really think about who he is to me. You know, I still love him very much, even though we weren't together and we had had this turbulent relationship and wondering if he would survive and thinking about filming. And that was where that kind of whole moment happened. And we landed and luckily he was still alive. And, you know, it was an awesome moment. And then I got to the hospital and then it was really that he continued to survive. And that was... You know, it, I just stayed there throughout the whole thing because really at the very beginning when I first went, I had no idea what was going to happen. And then once you're there, obviously, when you love someone, you don't want to leave their side. And I just stayed and together we got through it. But, but why film it? Like, mm -hmm. what was that the kind of crystallized moment you said, this is something that I want to capture? And did you want to capture it for yourself, mm -hmm. for each other? or for the world? Sure, there was a couple of reasons. So we'd just been filming Phil, Eduardo and I for a television show that Eduardo and I had been working on. So I had a camera. I was used to filming Eduardo. So that was one side of things. Another side of it was um, I was listed as one of the signers for him. So when he was in operation, I could sign things away. And I was worried that he was on so many drugs that afterwards he wouldn't remember what he'd been through. And maybe on the other side of it, be why, you know, why did that happen? Why did this happen? And it would be good to have footage and photography to say, hey, this is what your hand looked like before it had to be removed and things like that. So it was a little bit of personal documentation, a little bit because we were used to filming. And as it transpired while we were in the ICU, we learned that so many people don't get out the other side because they're so unmotivated for rehabilitation and learning from the doctors and nurses during that time that showing other people how to get through it would be beneficial. So we just continued and turned it into a documentary. And, and I should add, too, you know, uh, we had a lot of support. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we were working with a production team called Citizen Pictures out of Denver who were quick to arrive and, and lend some gear. And we were in touch with Phil, who, as Jen mentioned, you know, had just filmed a trailer for a TV concept we have, and, and Phil was also incredibly supportive in just the very early days of, yeah, document it. I mean, that's the power of storytelling, you know, is mm -hmm. you don't know, sometimes you don't know what you're going to do with it, but you just go out on a limb and yeah. you just start capturing it. doesn't always work out. I'm no. sure that most yes. documentaries that start don't get finished. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, is that, Phil, is that true, right? And I guess the second thing is, you know, what, um, you're a critically acclaimed documentary filmmaker. You just released Unbranded. You're doing other things. What kind of drew you to this project? How did right. you get involved? How did it come together? Sure. Yeah, like they mentioned, it started with um, this trailer for a TV show. So Ed and Jen and myself, we all live in Bozeman, Montana, and they approached me with this idea of outdoor cooking and making these meals in the outdoor while being active and surfing and skateboarding and climbing, all these cool things. So we spent six months to a year working on that. 
put together this awesome trailer. Citizen Pictures went out and pitched it. Almost sold within five days of the Food Network, and he got his injury. So put a complete halt on that, and that's where Jen was explaining she decided to film the entire stay in the ICU with this incredible footage, um, really raw, emotional, um, just footage that you don't really see in, in survival stories or films or anything like that. And then when Ed got back to Montana, we just kept filming all these stages. So him getting back into the outdoors, into life, and we got to a point where we kind of all sat together, Dennis Ager, producer that's also mm -hmm. here, and decided what do we do with this archive? Like, Once he started recovering physically, we started to see the both of them having these effects on people and kids in a positive way. So let's use this story on a bigger level and, and make a film. You know, l listening to all this, one, one thing that I walk away with is um, the importance of, again, people. I want to go back to that and advocacy. And, you know, I'm delighted to uh, let everyone know today we actually have Aaron Hattersley with us. Aaron is the interim lead of the Googler Disability Alliance, which is at GoDA. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the Disability Alliance, it advocates on behalf of and helps thousands of Googlers around the world who have disabilities that are either known or unknown. Um, so it's one of the most important what we call ERGs, employee resource groups here. Um, and when I have gotten to know some people who are part of the Disability Alliance, quite often they have an advocate, whether it's someone at home, right, or someone here at Google, their manager, a peer, who really makes their lives better and kind of makes their professional life at Google possible. So I have a two-part question, really. Um, uh, Eduardo, like, if people find themselves in a situation like yours, right, or a medical situation, how important is to have an advocate, both in terms of getting your life back on track, and I would also posit actually helping navigate the medical industrial complex where you have doctors all over the place. So can you give us some advice there? Because everyone at some point or another finds themselves in a situation, not exactly like yours, but in a situation like that. What would you recommend? Yeah, it, that's, a, that's a really good point and a great question. And it's actually, for me, that to that point, that was the genesis of my turning point to say, yeah, I'm going to go all in and sort of reveal this very private, you know, um, exceptionally intimate part of my life in that I think this can be a tool and a resource for a lot of people. And um, there, you know, when Jen and I, when we were in ICU, we spent quite a bit of time Googling. <laughs> yeah, a you lot know. of time Googling. Yeah, we did. It was a best friend. <laughs> yeah. Truly, just put yourself in this position. And um, this is the power of sharing information, which is, I think, what we're doing with Charged. You know, is, is we're sharing information also. So we're kind of in cahoots, right? We're in business together in, in that I just lost my hand. So you wake up and, and you're completely rewriting who you are. What do you do? I mean, I think you start researching very quickly. Mm -hmm. How do you surf with one hand? How do you fly fish? How do you cook? How do you do all these things? What does the term prosthetic mean? You know, um, who is the best upper body? You know, Pros, uh, prostitution in the United States. And you start looking into it, mm -hmm. and you're in a scrambled frenzy to understand where you're going to find your way back to being whole, like whole again. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so really with this film, you know, I think, I think you, need, you need to have an advocate. You need to have, and we found, we found mentors in Salt Lake City, because I was at the University of Utah, other amputees that were really doing what we're trying to do with Charge. They, they survived an insane injury. Um, or were congenital-based amputees, and then I could look at their story. You know, as a chef, uh, Michael Caine in the UK, and I remember watching a YouTube video um, of him cooking, and, you know, all respect to that chef. I remember watching, and just, it was like one of the first, it was like one of maybe two times where I truly erupted in just uh, total grief, you know, and loss, because I'm watching this chef cook with a prosthetic, which is phenomenal, to think of, but at the same time, I'm watching a dance and a movement I used to know by heart, and I'm seeing it done in a way that just seemed like you had muck boots on your hands and you're trying to do this dexterous movement. I'm thinking like, ah, oh, I gotta, you know, but it crushed me, but at the same time, it's impressive. So it gave us, I mean, you know, having other examples was that light at the end of the tunnel to say like, okay, you're an amputee, but it's not game over. Right. You know, look at this guy fishing. Look at this person wakeboarding. There's folks all over the world painting, doing amazing things without their limbs. You know, I think it's the brain, if the brain and the spirit and soul and the heart are intact, like that's, 
square one. So it kind of makes me think, and this is really a question for all three of you, because sometimes it's hard to see yourself, right? You have your own experience, and then you, you, your experience is shared by others you're wa watching go through the journey. So what about you was the physically hardest thing to do when this was done? What were two or three things that just were wrote memory beforehand and afterwards were incredibly hard? And what did that teach you? And having watched Eduardo through this, like, what did you see? And also, how do people react to you differently, yeah. right, before and after? And I'm sure you'd have thoughts on that as well. I remember opening jars became a team mm. effort. You know, <laughs> like I'd hold the jar and Edward unscrew the jar. That was one of the first little things I think I noticed in terms of physical change. I mean, the biggest thing, he says it in that scene that you saw at the Challenge Athletes is, Ed and I, we hunt together, we hike together, all these things. He tackles the physical, he puts his head down, he gets it done, learns the first day fly fishing, he had it down, he was catching fish. It's, it's incredible. But it was the emotional journey that was the most difficult. So going through that with him, and I knew we had to document that process of once he got to back to all the, the things, cooking and the stuff in the outdoors, I saw his biggest challenge was when he tackled everything that happened to him, mm -hmm. recovering things in his relationship and his family and everything like that. So by far, I saw that as the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, and speaking of which, you know, Montana, I would kind of view as a character in this documentary, right? And that it's, it's an entity unto itself. So what role did Montana um, in general, nature in particular, have on your um, therapy and your recovery? I could get lost down a serious <laughs> tunnel here. Um, and I tend to be wordy if I'm given a leash or not given a leash. I'll cut you off. Don't worry. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, no, I keep it succinct because it is quite, quite simple that... Um, Montana for me is, is just a super, super true example of, of just like simple perfection. It's nature abounds. You have landscapes and, and, and sort of viewscapes everywhere, everywhere you turn. And when you are at square one starting over and trying to reimagine, you know, what better place than to I maybe communicate with nature on some level and to sort of just open, your, open yourself up to dream big and say, okay, I'm gonna see how far I can walk today. Or, um, you know, it, it, was, it was just a, an awesomely um, inspiring setting to start rewriting my story. Yeah. And then there's some more subtle parts too. And, and for me, you know, I spend a lot of time, if I can, in the woods, hiking or on the river, <coughs> fishing, or generally just outside. And if you look at what we do here, what we do with our mind, what we do with our hands, we're striving consistently, I think, for some type of perfection or some type of repeatable perfection. And Mother Nature, I don't think, perfection is very different in Mother Nature. It's consistently different from one leaf to the next on the same branch, right? And in that, I think I started to see an example of, okay, I mean, that, that tree is beautiful, even though it's got a limb snapped off it and it's different. Sure. You know, and I started to see sort of like, hey, well, I'm nature made and I'm different, but it doesn't mean that this can't be beautiful still. Like, mm -hmm. you know, how I view myself. So, um, you know, Eduardo, one thing kind of uh, blew me away was the fact that you were in the hospital. Um, you were recovering from this and you found out at that same point in time that you were uh, suffering from testicular cancer. So, you know, at what point in your recovery journey were you there and how did that affect you going forward? Um, it's fairly inconvenient. <laughs> you know, um, you, I mean, if you recall, it was one of those things where when you, you know, I say we actually, because it was a team when you have 21 surgeries ahead of you or in totality to accomplish and you need to stop halfway through those and go tackle three months of chemo. Um, it's strange, you know, I, I honestly feel like I didn't have much of an opportunity to be even scared by it because I was in something that I felt was far, more, had far more grave consequences. Mm -hmm. And um, it took years for me to come around and actually own up to the fact that I'm a cancer patient, I'm a cancer survivor. You know, but I really just kind of took it on, did the chemotherapy, shelved it. Jen reminds me often, she's like, hey, don't always just put on a brave face. It was horrible. Mm -hmm. You know, like you were ill and sick and in pain and, you know, felt awful a lot of the times. And I, I 
think there's a part of my brain that tends to try and forget about that. And then it was just this three month chapter that I shelved and then went back to kind of reconstructing my scalp wounds and some of my other injuries. Um, so really, the, I think that where I own it today mm -hmm. is in trying to work with cancer support and cancer awareness groups like First Ascents. Uh, does a phenomenal job taking, um, I think their program is open for 20 year olds through 40 year olds to put them in a community to say, hey, it's okay to own cancer in whatever level you're at, whether you're in treatment or you're surviving or, you know, if you're in a terminal um, situation and, um, and still access your limitations, like go big, surf, climb, kayak, all their programs. So for me, it was, it was a hiccup that has further just engaged my recovery, you know. So, so Jen, you know, um, anyone who's been through a situation like this knows that the caregiver, um, they're, they're giving care, but their life is continuing. Mm -hmm. Life beckons. You have to make money, get a job, get stuff done. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what were your greatest challenges in taking care of Eduardo during this period mm -hmm. and actually running your own life and getting your own life back on track? As sure. I think uh, we were actually very fortunate in the sense that we co-own the same company. So while we were in the hospital, we'd still be working on the company. You know, I had the laptop out in my chair next to his bed, just, you know, running as much of it as I could do. So in the sense of me working and earning money, we were fortunate in that situation. But I think one of the toughest things is remembering to look after yourself and then finding joy in the small things. Like we definitely tried mm -hmm. to watch stand-up comedy and dance and do all these little things that we could to keep our, you know, ourselves lifted. And then I think... Uh, yeah, it really is just accepting what you've lost is you've lost. So we were very much, okay, the hand is gone. There's nothing we can do about that. However, there's many other things that we've still got. Let's not lose our house. Let's not lose our business. Let's focus on everything we still had. And I think that helped both of us get through everything. Team effort. Yeah. So, um, Phil, as you kind of like, as a documentary filmmaker, mm -hmm. and you know, here in the audience we have people who tell stories for a living, some communications folks, marketing people as well. So you have a, a multi-layered story here mm -hmm. with a lot of emotion, mm -hmm. a lot of different concurrent and hard events, yeah. right? So how did you bring together a cohesive narrative, a story that actually resonate with people, sure. right? So what's, what's, what's the story there? How do you do it in an hour and a half? Yeah, <laughs> we saw our editor, Tony Hale, was here to help explain <laughs> that because he had to go through hundreds of hours of footage to, to pull this together. but. You know, when we sat down, when we had all this footage to decide, what are we doing with this? Is this just a half hour survival show? What's the bigger picture? And as we started diving into it, learning more about the relationship, his past, his family, different things with his father, we're like, there's a bigger story here. And really we needed their trust to be able to dive into that, to expose some mistakes that were made in the past, to show where he's come, where the both of them have come today. So that was, our greatest challenge was getting there. And I remember we had a talk about, I didn't want to do this if, if it was going to ruin our friendship because later on they could watch it and see like, oh, you made me look terrible there. Right. <laughs> like, you know, I've seen it, it's, it's tough. And, um, but really that's not our goal. Our goal is to show all this, to be vulnerable, to show what they came through to get to the other side. So um, it was amazing that they trusted our team to dive that deep into the into the whole journey. Mm -hmm. And so um, you, uh, I'm thinking about your relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, Eduardo, Jen, what was your relationship like before this happened? And what is your friendship like now? And how has mm -hmm. that changed? How has, what happened to both of you really, how has it impacted your friendship and relationship way of working together as co-business owners today? It must be complicated. Mm -hmm. It's not me. At least, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think when you go through something like this with someone, it definitely forces you to shift the less important stuff to the side. I think mm. maybe if Eduardo hadn't have been injured, we would have probably gone our separate ways, maybe more quickly. But you develop. I, th I don't. Know, I think they call it a trauma bond, is what they call it. Is when you're you know really with somebody the whole time. And I think our friendship blossomed through that because our relationship before was extremely intense and turbulent and I think the injury was just like okay I definitely care about this person and I definitely want him to be okay and to be there what do you think yeah no I I, I, I agree with that I um I think you know life or death seems to be the great equalizer right mm -hmm. and not saying that all mistakes are forgiven should you survive something um but 
it just it levels the playing field only just a little bit to for me, you know, and, and individually, whether you're the patient or the caregiver to say, okay, well, tomorrow, you know, who will I decide to be? You know, how am I going to rewrite this? Whether it's my own journey or my journey as a friend with Jen or others for, the, for that matter. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's when someone has impacted your life as Jen has and, you know, being there in such a crucial part of my life, it's a really terrific feeling, to be honest, to wake up and kind of know how high the stakes are. I mean, sometimes it's nice when the stakes are high because it, you feel more driven to purpose. You know, when I, th I think about this, um, I guess a question I have is, you know, is, is optimism a choice, right? And is it a choice you have to make each day and each minute? Because looking at what you've gone through, what all of you have gone through, um, I, I think there must have been moments when you were ready to just kind of throw in the towel, just say, screw it, I don't want to do, do the film. I don't want to recover anymore. I just want to go home and watch TV, right? So, like, what would you recommend to anyone who's gone through any type of a trauma, right? a physical trauma, psychological trauma, relationship trauma, in terms of getting their life back on track? And, you know, is it a decision? How do you do it? Um, and how do you go about it? Mm -hmm. Is that for me? All of you. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I think what's interesting is obviously what we went through it was without a doubt a huge thing, but the reality is that in a burn trauma ICU, life is very tough. You're surrounded by people that are dealing with insane things. And so I think that's when you really kind of take it in yourself and say, okay, you know, this is our little room. This is our mm -hmm. moment. What do we have? Is that okay? He's Fortunately, in Ed's case, he's only lost one hand. He still has a hand. Mm -hmm. We met a lot of people who'd lost both arms and right. both legs. We were meeting people who had been burned to their core, and you know they were going to be in a bed for the next five years at least if they make it through. Like you definitely have to, you know, take into yourself what what are we dealing with, and we tried to find the positives as much as we could. Um, and I think by doing that, we did actually do very well. And it's incredible what people go through. You must have met some pretty with. amazing people through this process. Amazing. Do you people. keep in touch with them? Yes. I oh, do. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. That's Phil. You should. You want to say something towards? Well, I would say one. Um, it didn't unfortunately make the film, but a big reason we decided you decided to tell your story was we went back to the ICU in, in Salt Lake City and uh, met up with the doctors and nurses. And basically, in the, in the trailer where you see, you know, Eduardo said to me, I would never go back. And that's something he's only heard a couple times in, in all, through all of his patients. So it's, it's like going back, seeing the effect and on both ways. He's inspired to talk to his doctors, but they're also inspired to see him come back and where they've come to. So that, that, That's Dr. William Morris in the film, yeah. who was the surgeon on call when I walked in quote unquote, in his words, a bag of bones with a heartbeat. And in that day, you know, um, I, I, he whispered in my ear, you know, it's so good to see you again, following kind of a pow out in the hallway with nurses that were on our team and on our, on our care team. And um, I swear I felt so much emotional, like pain come out in those words, for everyone he's never saved, for every patient that he was not able to keep, keep on earth. Um, and I also felt like he was saying, a lot of them give up. A lot of people give up when the going gets tough. You know, the question from Phil was about optimism and whether that's a choice or not. And that is a choice, but it's also a choice on whether we share that or not, right? You know, we can keep so many of these beautiful things that we have ownership right here and never let them out. You know, something happens on the street on our way out of this building today and someone bumps into you. We have a choice on whether we turn around and scowl or whether we just give a human benefit of the doubt of just, oh, that was someone's shoulder on my shoulder. Good to be alive, you know, and, and rather than bounce that negativity out. And so I think when Dr. William Morris in that moment with him, I felt like, what am I doing hiding this recovery? It's true, you know? I survived something I should probably, I should not have lived through. And maybe there's a responsibility in sharing that with others. 
And in turn, maybe through this film, through Charged and through this documentary, there's some story that supersedes my story, you know, and, and kind of affects others that then others can in turn take and pass on and pass on, which is, you know, it's first you got to dream big. And then with that dream, you got to act on those dreams and be optimistic about our own ability to overcome almost all obstacles to the point. It's great. So this is a question for all three of you. Like, you know, in, in doing this and going out and telling that story, you've built a community of um, you know, injured veterans, I would presume, right? Like children who've lost their arms. We saw the video. People who've been through really, really hard stuff, really, really hard times. So if you look through all of them, if you had to like kind of draw a narrative, like a couple common points between all of them in terms of what they've done to rebuild their lives, what are those two or three things that you've seen with people who've actually done that thing and actually are successful in recovering or on that journey? Yeah, is it unending belief, ownership, you know, be true to yourselves. What does that mean, ownership? I've got to ask. It, 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 it means no longer pretending that I have my left hand, right? It means being very proud of who I am every day when I wake up. And, and just, this is me. This is me out of the closet, you know? Um, and then relying on others, right? Responsibly relying on others. Being like, hey, Phil, I'm challenged by you wanting to film me tomorrow. But I'm a, let's talk about it, you know, rather than just letting things happen. Share the process with your team. That's how the team develops, you know? Oh, absolutely. I think perseverance is the one thing. You know, if I said to you, go and learn the violin, and you practice it three times, and you wouldn't Not be very happen, good. But, yeah. but if you, <laughs> that, you, know, you went to learn the violin, and you practice every single day for hours, by this time next year, you might not be too bad. You know? yeah. And it's the same thing, I think, from meeting these people are getting used to using prosthetics and those things. It's literally trying not to get angry and just accepting and just doing those little tiny things every single day. And then building on that, and a year later, it's yeah, manageable. The, the thing I noticed, the, just the simple thing, is just the appreciation for life. Like with that Challenge Athletes group, and we filmed this triathlon, mm -hmm. all of them had that same thing and treated every single day as a gift. And so that was really neat to see. So what can tell us about, about the, the documentary itself, right? Meaning that, you know, what are your plans with it? How can people in the audience, how can people watching this on YouTube, what can they do to actually help get that story out? Where do you want to bring this story from here? Where can people see it? Mm -hmm. Sure. So the Charged film is in the middle of its festival process right now. So we are touring the country, showing in select theaters, um, in festivals around the nation. If you go to our website, chargefilm.com, or follow us on Facebook, and we, you know, we update it constantly, our festival schedule. We are looking and hoping for distribution so that anybody in the world can get online and watch the film. And so, fingers crossed, that's upcoming. And then, you know, for me personally, I, I hope to use it as a tool to continue to keep me present with this process, you know? And I think it is my calling, um, if to say something like that, that um, is to use this as an example, to remind me every day and to just share with others what surviving can really look like. You can thrive. Um, I had the immense honor of seeing this film at Telluride Film Festival last year, and it was met with immense, I mean, people just were blown away. Um, one of my favorite scenes from the film was when a young boy at a high school you were speaking at comes up and kind of very vulnerably comes and talks to, to you about his brother who went through, I think he was a burn victim or, or something. Um, I'm curious what's that, what that's like for you, being on the receiving end of people seeing you so vulnerable on the screen and then coming up and sharing their own stories. Yeah. I feel like it's a tithe, right? Um, and it, it's interesting when there's sort of a reciprocal figure eight that happens between you and me and that exchange and that I need to continually feel purpose with this project. And it's, it's not even a project, it's this part of my life and sharing this film. And just like feeling that emotional release from my surgeon in the hallway, basically charging me and saying, what are you doing with this? Why aren't you using this for good in the world? And then if I can, you know, if we can share this film and somehow access a part of someone that is not Eduardo Garcia, but is somewhere inside of that other person, 
where then they open up and they own an experience that is like a splinter and they allow it to come out. They become empowered with their own voice and with their own emotions and their own strength to be vulnerable, right? And, uh, and then, so when I get that, it just, it puts a big, big smile on my face and in, in my heart just to say, yeah, this is working. This is what needs to happen, you know, sharing this joie de vivre, you know, like this joy of life in any form. So you mentioned that you wouldn't change what happened to you, but that you would, you would have done, if you could go back, you would have done some other things differently or you would change some other things. So I was just kind of curious what you meant by that. I think the, well, that's a question I get asked a lot is, hey, if you could go back to that day, would you do it differently? And I mean, I, I was, that, that day I was just being me. I was hunting. It was an accident um, and an injury that no one ever wishes on anyone. Um, and it, it's really, it's just unfortunate for me that the other other decisions I've made in my life that have affected others, lying, cheating, stealing, um, you know, those I'm not proud of, right? Those are moments of weakness where I really stepped outside of that true person that I would like to be in this world and for whatever reason digressed into a person that, you know, I don't particularly want to lead with every day. Um, so I think that's what I mean by is when I wake up and be an honest man every day. And the day I was out in the woods hiking, that was a very honest situation. And therefore, I hold no angst towards that day. I'm curious, as both a company, as Google, and then us as individuals, how we can be most helpful in propelling your story or your mission or whatever. If you were to have an ask of us, what is that ask? That's a great question. Thank no. you. <laughs> you have 70,000 Googlers who can help, so. Oh. Yeah. Please. I think, oh. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. How can others help? Um, this is an independent film. You know, um, this is something that we did because as collectively, as a filmmaker, and as participants and subjects, we said this is a message worth sharing, and yet our bandwidth is like a cocktail straw, <laughs> right? So, um, and we are not distributed yet, so the help that we need is to go watch our trailer, read our bios and understand kind of more about the film and what our, and our message and then share it, share it and share it and share it again. Because I do believe that there is a value to sharing this joy of life with others and charged film for me is very much just that. It's an example of what really living charged can be. And I think it's probably a really terrific time in our world to get that message out in a big way. You're here. Well, um, uh, Philip, Eduardo, and Jennifer, thank you for coming to Google today. And rest thank assured, you. we are going to do all we can to help you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all. Thank you.